We are in the middle of a series uh, on the promises of God. And, and what we have been talking about in this series is that God has made a number of promises to his people. And typically what he does is he engages in a covenant. He engages in some kind of a, almost like a contract with his people. It's a little bit more intense than a contract. But he engages with, in this covenant with them saying, I'm going to do these things. And you're going to listen and you're going to follow in response to what I'm doing. Okay? And so today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to look at the beginning of essentially a family meeting that God has with the people of Israel. They're at the foot of Mount Sinai. This is where the Ten Commandments come down. He's talking to Moses, and he's saying, I've done certain things for you, and now this is what you're going to do in response. This is a family meeting. Do I have any Bluey fans in the audience? Right on. Uh, I love the number of grown-ups whose like, hands shot up. Like I was offering like free Super Bowl tickets. Like, yeah. No, I just watched a Bluey episode about a family meeting. Family meetings are important. They're, they're, they're important because usually you have a family meeting because something has happened, something has changed, or something's going on in the family that needs to be addressed, or there's a change coming in the relationship, and then you're going to talk about this is how we're going to move forward in the future. Some of you may have experienced this as well, it's called a DTR, the define the relationship. That's like a sort of like a proto-family meeting, I guess if everything goes well, it's a proto-family meeting. You're talking about, hey, what are we doing? What is, what is, what is this relationship? Or, are you feeling about me the same way I'm feeling about you? And how are we going to move forward into the future? And so that's what we're looking at today in Exodus 19. And every single person, whether you are a part of a family, whether you're part of a church, whether part of your corporation, no matter what relationships you are in, you benefit from understanding, from everybody being on the same page in regards to the relationship. If you are not on the same page in the relationship, there's confusion, there's hurt feelings, there's not the same ground for conducting yourself. And today God is laying out, we're all gonna get on the same page today as to what's happening, and we're gonna talk about how God wants to have a relationship with us so that we can be on the same page with him. Like I said, we're in Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to see that God promises, has promises for the past in our relationship, for the present and the future. But we're going to start with today. We're going to start with the present. So God promises us a relationship that is going to be for today. Look at verse nine, sorry, chapter 19, verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai and they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai and they encamped in the wilderness there Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. So let's start there. So stop there. So there's a lot that has happened between our, our last sermon last week and now. Last week we talked about Abram, and since then, much has changed. Abram had a son named Isaac with his wife Sarah. Isaac had two sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob has 12 sons, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. They all moved to Egypt to escape a famine. And they are very productive, very reproductive in the land of Egypt. They become like a whole like, group of people. So much so that Pharaoh gets a little nervous and starts to enslave them because he's scared of how many people that they are. And God uses this to continue to multiply them. And then he brings them out. Ten plagues. You've all seen The Prince of Egypt, right? Actually, I saw it for the first time like three weeks ago. Amazing film. Where have I been? And so he brings them all out, and through the, the plagues, the Passover, the, the parting of the Red Sea, and then we are picking up the story three months later. That's where we're at in Exodus 19. This has been three months, and these three months have been wandering in the wilderness. And notice what it says in the first two verses. The Bible uses the word wilderness three times. And these wanderings in the wilderness are exactly what you think they would be. They are miserable. They're confusing. They're frustrating. There's nothing to eat, especially for a whole nation of people. There's nothing to drink. God provides water for them. And then, like I said, there's nothing to eat. So he rains down manna or bread from heaven. And then there's nothing to drink again. And so he provides water from the rock. 
So this whole time is going on. And they finally get to Mount Sinai, which is where Abram, kind of, or not Abram, Moses met with God the first time. And he brings them there and Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, to receive the whole law, the old covenant. And if you want to know just how bad, how frustrated people are in the people of Israel, uh, in the previous chapter, Moses is from sunup until sundown. sundown. He is uh, uh, having conversations with people. He's solving uh, disputes among the people. They are, there's so much infighting that his own father-in-law is like, dude, you got to get some help, man. You're, way, you're doing this way too much. That's how much fighting is going on with the people. And so Israel is here in the midst of the wilderness, and they are vulnerable, and they are exposed. They've been led out by this God who, after wandering for three months, doesn't seem to really know what he wants to do with this people that he's brought out of Egypt. The one guy that seems to be leading, that keeps keeping a lid on everything, he's going up on a mountain. And by the way, he's on that mountain for a long time, like 40 days, so much so that they think he's gone and this God doesn't know what he's doing. Let's make an idol for ourselves, a golden calf that we will then worship. And that's pretty much the story of Exodus. These people are incredibly vulnerable, incredibly exposed. Their needs are not being met. Their leadership seems to be confused. And Israel's just wandering in the wilderness. They're in this in-between period between this great event, the Passover and the parting of the Red Sea, and the great event of going into the promised land. And there's just this wilderness period. And many of you might find yourself in the same kind of wilderness period in your relationship with God, either because it's just this kind of stagnant period in your life, or it's something of your own making. You've kind of created this situation where it's this wilderness period with you and God. Sometimes... This can feel like a wilderness because you've reached a milestone in your life. You've maybe uh, gotten a new job and you're like, oh, I finally climbed the ladder. I'm kind of where I'm supposed to be. This is great. Or maybe you feel that way because you've, you've gotten married. You've, you've climbed that, that mountain or you've had kids. You've climbed that mountain and you're like, okay, so, so do we just like raise these things for like the next 20 years? Like what's, what's next? Or 30 years, depending on how your kids are? Like, dude, is this what we do? And it can feel stagnant. It can feel, it can feel like a wilderness. Like, is this it? Like, what's the next hurdle? What's the next milestone, right? Or maybe you're waiting on the results of a medical test. Like, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, I, I'm just wandering, right? Maybe you're trying to find out if you're going to get into a school that you've applied to. Maybe you're trying to find out if the job you've applied to is going to say yes. Or maybe you're, you're looking at the person uh, that you're in a relationship with and you're like, I don't know if they're the right one or not. If somebody elbowed you just then, that's concerning. <laughs> or maybe you've made this season into a wilderness. Maybe this is you. You've got some wanderlust in you right now. You're, you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm very thankful, God, for what you're doing in my life. I, I recognize the blessings you've given me, but God... I just, I'm getting antsy, Lord. I'm, what's the next thing? I want to I do something. I'm bored. These seasons are kind of wandering in the wilderness. And these seasons can almost be more detrimental to our spiritual life than seasons of great abundance or seasons of great deprivation. And here's why. There's no external motivator to seek the Lord. When you are feeling the need of something, when you're missing something, when you're deprived of something, we go to God. We're like, God, I need this. I need you, God. I, we just sang about it. I need you now. We have an external motivator. Fear, worry, concern, whatever it is. When you're blessed, when you, when you sense the great blessing of God in your life, it's the same way. Oh, God, you're so good to us. Thank you, Lord. Look at all that you've done. We're so glad. We're so grateful. But oftentimes we're in this wilderness period where it's like, what's the next thing, God? What's the next thing? You look around, there's, there's no Pharaoh pursuing you in your life. There's no promised land that you feel like you're enjoying right now. You just see desert stretching out for miles and miles and miles. And you're like, what is next, God? What's next? God wants to do dramatic, amazing things in your life. He really does. And because we are so uh, accustomed to novelty, we don't recognize that God does do amazing things in our life every day. But we are expecting a Red Sea parting moment with God every single day, and that's not the way God works. 
the relationship with God, you will have those spiritual highs. You'll have those spiritual lows. But most of your spiritual life with God will be wilderness wanderings. And what I mean by that is it's going to be day to day, night to night, stretching on and following and trusting the Lord. That's what it's going to be like. If you want a real relationship with God, it has to be a relationship that is accustomed to the wilderness. Not just mountaintops, not just Red Sea. It's got to be a wilderness one. It's got to be day to day. You've got to engage with him every day. You got to spend time with him every single day. Even when you don't feel like it. That's the the strength of the dwell readings. You know what we don't do as a staff? We don't come by your house every day and knock on the door and be like, hey, Travis Cook from Park City's Baptist Church. You've probably maybe heard from me at some point. Uh, We just want to make sure that you were spending time with the Lord today. Would anybody like that? Because, I mean, we could hire some more people, I guess, and try it. But no, what we do is we give you the dwell journal. And we give you the dwell journal. We say, "This this this is our way of providing an external motivator to remind you that spending time with the Lord on a regular basis every day is going to benefit you. It's going to help you through your wilderness wanderings. That's why we give it to you. Because we can't be there every single day to help you and encourage you. We'd love to but we can't. In the absence of discipline, the absence of something, you will start to craft other things in your life that will provide those things. Because here's the thing. You know what the golden calf was? Yes, it was an idol, but it was there to make the wilderness more comfortable, more enjoyable, more relaxing, more secure. That's what it was there for. And many of the things that we put in our lives, many of the idols that we have in life, our life, we know they're not powerful, but they're usually just there to make us feel better about the wilderness. Most of us don't spend time with God on a daily basis, not because we don't want to, it's because we don't see how that's going to make the wilderness wanderings any better. It just sounds like one more thing we have to do. The daily rhythms that you have with God every single day will affect what your life is like when you come out of the wilderness. There was a uh, a ship captain uh, named Captain James Riley, which sounds like a great ship captain name. Captain James Riley, and he was a shipwrecked uh, in like the 1800s in Africa. And in in, in a touch of irony, uh, he was actually enslaved and taken uh, through the deserts. And eventually he escaped and he devoted his entire life from that point on to eradicating slavery. He took his wilderness wandering as something that happened to him and he allowed God to use that to drive him towards being an abolitionist. What you do in the wilderness will affect what you do out of the wilderness. So God has a plan for our present, but at the same time, every single person in this room has a history with God. And our history with God colors that relationship for today. So let's talk about how God also promises a relationship for yesterday. Look at verse three again. The Lord called to him, that's Moses, out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. You know what God doesn't do? God calls their attention to the past and the relationship, but he doesn't point out everything he's ever done. He doesn't say like, you know, remember this thing that I did with Abraham and remember this thing that I did with Isaac and remember Jacob, like we wrestled, it was cool. Noah, you remember all that? No, he points out three things. One thing with three facets, really. One, you remember what I did to the Egyptians and they're all sitting there, yeah, we saw that. That was like firsthand. You saw how I bore you out on eagle's wings, meaning I, I brought you out safely, swiftly. And you saw how I brought you to myself. It's important that you see this for what it is because we're going to debunk something that a lot of people think about the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant with God. Most people think that the Old Covenant is God telling Israel, if you do this, good things will happen to you. And if you don't do this, bad things will happen to you. And it's this give and take relationship. That is not the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant has some components of it that are, if you do this, you will receive blessings. If you don't do this, you will receive curses. Absolutely. But the first thing that God does to establish this relationship is he does something they don't ask for. He does something they don't expect. He does something they don't even deserve. He brings them out of slavery. He does it of his own volition. 
They do nothing to earn it. They can offer him nothing. God chooses the people of Israel. They're not the most numerous. They're not the most important. They're not the biggest. God chooses this group of people out of his grace. And he says, I'm going to take you out of slavery and I'm going to deliver you. And this moment becomes the seminal core moment of their entire relationship. Throughout the rest of their history, when God talks to them, he says, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt because that is the basis of their relationship. This act of grace by God that they didn't deserve, that they didn't expect. And look how God so poetically describes it. He didn't bear, this isn't Lord of the Rings. They didn't ride eagles out of Egypt. That would have been cool, but they didn't do that. He's being poetic. He's being romantic. God's saying, look what I did for you. And now I want to know, will you commit yourself to me? Will you be with me forever? Will you be my people? Every relationship has a foundational moment. If you talk to anybody, most people that are, that are married will say, yeah, I, rem- I, I, I know. I remember when I knew that this was the person I was going to spend my life with. Or if you have a friend, you're like, we went through that experience and I knew we were going to be best friends forever because we laughed at the same thing that was wildly inappropriate or we made fun of the same person or we both stood up for the person that was being made fun of, right? For Israel and God, their moment was Egypt. Their moment was Egypt. And those days made the relationship between God and Egypt what it was. And the same thing has happened to us. God, in his grace, sent his son to die for us because we were enslaved. We were enslaved to sin and death and evil, and God delivers us out of that slavery through this one seminal moment, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he asks you the same thing. Will you trust me? Will you follow me? Will you be in a relationship with me? And I know that many of you, I hope, in this room have done that. And maybe since then, it's been wilderness for you. You've fallen into addiction. You've fallen into sin. Maybe you've wandered from the faith. Maybe you've questioned the faith. You've been hurt by the church. Maybe you've gone into the wilderness, and the cross seems like a long time ago. Here's the thing you need to know about Jesus. Jesus went into the wilderness as well. In Matthew 4.1, Jesus has like a big spiritual moment. He passes through water as well, actually. He's baptized. Just like Israel passed through the Red Sea, Jesus is baptized. And then you would think you'd be like, hey, I'm going to go start my ministry. I'm going to go right out there. I'm I'm feeling a spiritual high. Let's go. Just like getting back from getaway weekend. Woo, everybody, let's go. No, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and is tempted and tested and beaten down. Just like many of you. You came to church this morning thinking, I'm going to get spiritually fed. I'm going to get, I'm going to get fuel. I'm going to feel good. And some of you are going to walk out of here today and be like, I didn't get the thing that I was hoping I was going to get. I didn't feel anything the whole morning. We sang songs, listened to Travis, really appreciate everybody. But you know what? And you know what God is going to tell you? You know what God wants to tell you today? The seminal moment in your relationship with God is not today. It is what he did on the cross for you and everything else that happens to you, everything else has to be colored in the light of what God has done on the cross. If you have a cancer diagnosis, that's awful. But yes, Christ has died for me. If you're struggling in your marriage, that's awful. But Christ has died for me. If you just got the best promotion you could ever get, you were doing your dream job. That's incredible. But Christ has died for you. Your entire life is colored by this one seminal moment in your relationship with God. And everything else is dictated by that, not by what's the current event going on in your life. And because of that, we now have a future in our relationship with God. So let's talk about how God also promises a relationship for the future. Look at verse 5. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. The rest of the old covenant is talked about in the the, the subsequent chapters. But what God is asking for Moses, and he sends Moses back down to the mountain. Like he's like climbed all the way up, and God gives him like three sentences, and he's like, No, go back and ask them if they want to do this. God's asking for a statement of intent. Some marriage, some weddings have this, 
where like the bride and the groom will come down and before they climb up the altar, they'll have statements of intent. It's like, will you, are you intending to do this? Are you intending to do this? God is asking for a statement of intent. Before we get into all the rules, before we get all the res- regulations, before we do the 10 commandments, and they're like, what are 10 commandments? He's like, it's gonna be a big deal. You just wait. Before we do all that, I need to know if you're serious about this. Because what God is saying is, I've shown you my love. I've shown you my affection. I've shown you that in Egypt, you are my treasured possession. Will you respond and will you, will you follow me? Because a lot of us think that when you're a treasured possession, you're put away, you're put aside. You don't have to do anything when you're the treasured possession. But that's not true. Shohei Otani just signed the largest sports contract ever of any sport, $700 million with the Los Angeles Dodgers. He is their treasured possession. And if he's not, I don't know what they're paying him for. He is their, his skill set is their treasured possession. They're hoping so much for him. Now, what do you think Dodgers fans would do if they were like, you know what? Shohei's our, our treasured possession. We value him more than anything else. We don't want him to get hurt or dirty. So we're just going to keep him in the clubhouse. If you want to see Shohei, you just come by. He'll sign some autographs, but we're not going to let him hit or pitch or do anything. No, that's insane. Your treasured possession is something that's put to use. And that's what God asks for from the people of Israel. He says, I want you to now serve. I want you to respond to my love by being what I'm going to call a kingdom of priests. Notice what he says. He says, you are a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. Now, this can mean that they are both a kingdom who have a mediating function between God and the rest of the world, but it can also mean a massive promotion for the people of Israel. Because in Egypt, the top of the pyramid, no pun intended, the top of the social pyramid was Pharaoh. And then underneath that, and they thought Pharaoh, by the way, was a god. And underneath that were all the priests that kept the cultic worship going. And then at the very bottom of the pyramid were the slaves. And so what God is saying to Israel here is, you served Pharaoh who thought he was a god as slaves. And now I'm asking you to move all the way up the pyramid and you're going to be, take the top two levels. You're going to be kings and you're going to be priests. And rather than serve a Pharaoh as slave, you're going to serve your creator as kings and priests. Do you want to have a promotion? Who wouldn't say yes to that? And we've been given something similar. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9. The apostle writes, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. As I said before, we were in bondage. We were in bondage to slave, uh, slave to sin, to death, to evil. And God in his grace brings us out. We have a new Moses. His name is Jesus Christ. And he did what Moses couldn't do. He set, Moses set the people free from the physical bondage, but he couldn't set them free from the bondage of their heart. And so very clear that he couldn't do it because of what's going on the whole time he's up on the mountain. They're making an idol. God invites you today, after he's broken your chains, if you will trust him, if you'll put your faith, rather than, than in your own self, so many of us want to be our own deliverer, So many of us refuse to admit that we have shackles on us. And God says, if you will just look and see your state and look and see what I have to offer you today, which is freedom from that, you can be a kingdom of priests. You can go from whatever rank you are on the social pyramid and he's gonna promote it. You're gonna be a kingdom of priests. And God offers this to us. But when he offers it to us, he says, now that you've taken this, if you've accepted this, if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, he says, this is now the ground rules of our relationship because every relationship has ground rules. That's what the whole purpose of a family meeting is. This is what we're doing. This is who we are. If you're gonna be a part of this family, this is how it's gonna work. And so God says, if you're involved in this relationship, here are some things that I would ask of you. And it can look different in different contexts, in different eras. In our era, it looks like coming to worship, being a part of the community of worship. If you're watching online, we're so glad. We, we have so many people watching online. But if you're in town, you should be here. If, if COVID taught us anything, it's that the online experience is not the same as being in person. Just be here with us. 
Be in a community, be in a connect group. That is the backbone of Park City's Baptist Church. It may not be the backbone anywhere else, but it is here. You gotta be a part of a group. Be in service. You are God's treasured possession. Don't be the player that's in the clubhouse being like, well, I'm a treasured possession. I'm just here to get fed and ice my arm. That's what ball players, they ice their arm. Ice it. Or this one if you're a lefty. Or both. I'm going to keep going there, just make it awkward. <laughs> you are God's treasured possession. But somebody who serves understands that they are not the only treasured possession of God. That there are other treasured possessions too. And they're this big, and they're this big, and they're this big, and they're this big. And they serve. And you've been called to serve the other treasured possessions that God has. And we give. We've been called to give. We've been called to take from what God has given us and to give. And these are generalities. These are not specifics. This is whether you're in this church or other churches, this is, this is basic church stuff. But you might want to know, hey, what's going on in our church? What's happening here at Park Cities? And so I'm going to close us in prayer. And then Pastor Jeff and some of our leaders are going to come up and they're going to tell you. We're going to have a family meeting right here. And it's, and it's going to be, this is the past. This is what has been happening. This is what God is doing now. And this is what we're hoping God will do in the future. So hang with us, stick with us. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to have a family meeting together. So let's pray. Father God, uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. And we thank you, God, that you have died. You've sent your son to die for us crucified, buried, and resurrected. And so Lord, we pray that you would shape our hearts, that you would guide us through the wilderness that we're in, maybe a stagnant period in our life, and you would remind us what you have done for us, the greatness that you've offered to us. And that we respond with, with so much gratitude, so much affection, and then we respond in service and love. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.